Uh, this is Let's Talk Storage. I'm Anthony Nocentino. I'm a principal field solution architect at a company called Pure Storage. This is not a vendor specific thing. I'm just going to talk about tech today and get as nerdy as possible and talk about why DBAs should care about storage. Um, I've been in school for a really long time. There's my contact information. Please follow me on Twitter. It's kind of my main way to interact with the community. It's pretty much how I got involved in this and met some of the best friends of my life. I write a bunch of courses on Pluralsight. Uh, if you want access to that content for free, please hit me up. I can give you some trial codes. I've written a bunch of books with my friend Ben, who's presenting today as well. So let's get started. So what we're going to talk about is today is precisely storage is where data lives, right? And yesterday, uh, Argenis and Andrew Presky and I were in a panel together, and we talked about the fact that no one really cares if a SQL server is online or available. What they care about is getting access to our data and our data lives on storage, right? And we'll talk a little bit about that today. We'll talk about how we get there, right, from our servers out into the storage devices with protocols and interconnects. So we'll talk about why that's important in understanding the technologies, not at a deep level, but making sure that what you buy or what you're consuming from your infrastructure team is what you're getting from a performance standpoint when you're working with your systems. And so being able to understand that performance, well, we have to be able to measure. And so we'll talk a little bit about how to measure and what the key performance metrics are when we talk about database and storage and why databases care about that. And then we'll get a little bit into precisely where data lives inside of a SQL server with regards to database files, transaction lock files, and file systems and how that all kind of stitches together. And then we'll look a little more closely at latency, which is really the core metric that we care about when we're talking about storage. Who here runs SQL Server on virtual machines? We'll talk a little bit about hypervisors because everyone runs, if it, if, uh, for the folks online, I'd say 95% of the audience raised their hand there. So we'll talk a little bit about hypervisors and I love telling stories because what we're talking about today is very practical. It might seem a little bit esoteric, we'll get really nerdy, watch green lights blink, but it has really impacts how we conduct business in our systems. And so storage is where data lives. And so SQL Server stores data on disks in files, right? So there's a fancy representation of a SQL server and a storage subsystem where data files and log files live, right? There's an interconnect that connects that SQL server to this data we're on in whatever storage subsystem we're using. And that can be local, right? Some people still have physical servers, not many of us, obviously, with drives that are inside of the server, right? And if it's inside the server, it's gonna be connected in a couple of different ways, PCI, SCSI, things like that, and also MVME, I need to add that to that slide there. It could also be remote. I work for a storage company that builds storage subsystems that are external to servers, right? And so that's going to be connected with things like Fiber Channel, iSCSI, MVME over Fabrics, and hold on, let me go back, uh, other interconnects. The primary thing I want to talk about here is the, each one of these protocols and interconnects has a specific performance capacity, like in terms of throughput and latency. And what I want you to understand with this is talk to your infrastructure folks and understand what that is. So for example, iSCSI, is most often connected with Ethernet. Ethernet comes in various speeds, 10, 25, and 40 gigabits per second. And so understanding that that's the throughput that you get and also having some expectations on latency. So you'll talk with your vendors to understand what the expected latency is for your platform. Why is that important? Because if I'm dispatching IO, I wanna make sure that I'm getting what I'm paying for from an infrastructure standpoint. And so being able to measure that is what we'll talk about here in a few minutes. In addition to those, uh, so we talked about SCSI a little bit, that's a block protocol for exchanging data. If you have SATA drives, you heard the term SATA before, right? The first word in SATA is serial attached SCSI, right? The serial sound like it's gonna be a thing that operates quickly, right? Because I'm gonna line up IOs in a row and dispatch all of those IOs. Maybe that's not great for platforms. Fiber channel is also a way much like Ethernet to establish a connection between a server and a storage subsystem. So we're seeing 16 gigabits, 30 gigabits per second, or 32 gigabits per second inside of the fiber channel world. Talked about iSCSI in pretty good detail a second ago. NVMe, so this is where we're at today, is this thing called NVMe, is the ability to dispatch IOs from an operating system concurrently, in parallel, which that sounds really cool, right? Because I can dispatch IOs at the same time which means I can drive more I.O., right, at lower latencies because I can dispatch those I.O.s concurrently into a storage subsystem. Most often you'll find NVMe inside of a server, right? We'll probably all have laptops today that have NVMe in them, and they're fantastically fast. To extend that to things like remote storage subsystems, that's where NVMe over fabrics come in, where I can take 
in-memory protocols, or traditionally in-memory protocols, and extend them outside of the server. That's kind of bleeding edge technology today. For example, Windows doesn't quite support this yet, Linux does. But this is going to be where we're looking at in the next year or two with regards to how to dispatch IOs externally to storage devices. And we talk about storage devices. I do work for this company, but we'll leave that out of the uh, scope of the conversation today. And different ways that we can attach storage to our environment. So these bottom two here, we're going to attach via either Ethernet, fiber channel, things like that. These top two here are ways that we can attach storage inside of a server. The top right, that Intel device being an Optane drive, which provides sub-millisecond latency into a, um, into a drive. And that's one on the top left there is what's called an NV dim or non-volatile dim. Does anyone have non-volatile dims in any of their servers today? Great. Bleeding edge tech. Maybe about two to five years ago, but what we're seeing now is this has the ability to give you nanosecond latencies into a storage device. Nanosecond latencies into a storage device. So memory speeds. Moreover, uh, things like um, Linux and SQL Server are able to take advantage of this device because this is a non-volatile memory dim, which means I can write into this device in a nanosecond operation, and it's persistent, which means we don't have to traverse the I.O. path inside of an operating system. This is, can actually be addressed via a direct memory copy, which means I can copy from this process to that process, and it's persistent. So if you write into a transaction log, conventionally, that's going to fall down the I.O. path and eventually get dispatched out to the disk. In this case, it's literally mem memory copy, so it's significantly less instructions, and my process doesn't have to transition from kernel space or user space to kernel space. All right, so let's talk about measurements. So I talked a little bit about latency and bandwidth and things like that and why they're uh, important. Let's dig a little bit closer. So the things that we care about, latency throughput, which is bandwidth and IOPS. So latency is how long a request takes. I talked a second ago about dispatching an I.O. and going down that path. It's the measurement of that time, right? And so if I have to do something like a synchronous write from an operating system, I have to wait for that entire I.O. to traverse, get committed, and then come back to me and report that it's finished. So that's where transaction logs fall in. They're synchronous IOs. So if I'm dispatching an IO, I can't move on to the next thing until I write out to the disk and come back up. I have to wait to do the next transaction. That latency can slow down my applications if the storage subsystem can't perform and support what I want to uh, do. And that's going to lead to a thing called queuing. If I'm dispatching IOs, my applications are going to start slowing down, and users are going to start getting sad. Throughput is the amount of data that's being moved, generally measured in things like megabytes per second or mega, uh, gigabytes per second, so big B, right, is what we're seeing there. And that's going to be a, a function of the storage interconnect, like we talked about earlier, things like Ethernet, uh, 10, 25, 100 gigabits, fiber channel, 16, 32 gigabits. Notice I'm using gigabits there, so that's little b. So when you're working with those measurements, making sure that you're using the correct uh, conversion between the two. I've been working in storage for 20 years, and I still mess this up. This is also going to be defined by the type of storage that you connect on the back end. So if you buy a storage device, it's going to have some sort of um, expected performance characteristics in terms of latency and throughput. And so again, making sure that you're getting what you pay for from your infrastructure team when you're consuming those services. IOPS. Who's heard of the term IOPS before today? Right, this is like the most overloaded term. About half of the audience raised their hand. This is the most overloaded term in the storage uh, industry. It's the number of requests, right? So I'm, as I'm dispatching requests, it's how many things I'm doing. But this size of the request depends on what we're doing. SQL Server has IOs in all different sizes, down from 512 bytes up to 8 megabytes, right? So if I'm writing, you know, what is uh, 10 IOs at 8 megabytes or 10 IOs at 512 bytes? Two very different things. And so when you're looking at IOPS, Make sure that you're kind of doing that conversion and look at the average I.O. size, not an I.O. size. And storage vendors will generally measure things in like 4K I.O.s, which may or may not be accurate for your workload. And most of the OLTP systems that I see in customer sites is about 30K I.O.s, right, on average. It can depend on what the workload is. So why? Like why, does, why do we need to care about things from a SQL Server standpoint? Uh, just kind of bringing this back to business. Does, does your company sell stuff? If there's latency in your storage subsystem, you can't sell stuff fast, right? As things come in, people click, they're going to get sad, right? And I've done this for actually for many e-commerce sites. When they want to conduct transactions, we have to wait for a log flusher buff to sell a thing, right? That's a big deal. 
Is your system time sensitive? Do you trade stocks, finances, banking, right? I wanna make sure that I'm doing things efficiently and quickly in my storage subsystem. And so we can categorize those things as OLTP, or online transaction processing workloads. Those are gonna be latency sensitive, right? Throughput, do users need, do, you, like, do your users run reports? Does anybody run reports on their production systems, right? Yeah, yep, yep, about half the audience again. That's gonna be generally throughput operations because I'm gonna go across large swaths of, of data, aggregate that data, and present it back to a user. So I need to read lots of stuff, right? So throughput matters there. Anybody back up their databases, right? Who backs up their databases? My entire family backs up their databases, right? So <laughs> that's a throughput operation, right? The most, probably the most throughput operation outside of CheckDB. Those would be uh, kind of generalized as OLAP sensitive or on online analytical processing workloads. So they're gonna be throughput sensitive. IOPS, larger requests take longer in time. So just put that in your brain. People get real hung up on this. Even uh, senior escalation support engineers at organizations I've worked with will come to me and go, this IO is taking longer. I'm like, it's half a megabyte. Like it's this big thing. It's gonna take longer to move that much data between A and B. If it's a 512 byte, transaction and that's you know creeping up there in time then i start paying attention so if you see a bump up in latency in your system maybe you had an inflection in the io and your ios are getting larger for that duration and if it comes back down then you're happy but if that latency goes up and stays up then you should start paying attention who has stuff in the cloud does anybody have stuff in the cloud all right about a third of y'all have a stuff in the cloud oftentimes your ios in the cloud are going to be governed on iops you're going to buy some amount of iops from your cloud vendor whether it's going to be per disk that you allocate or the number of iops that the virtual machine that you're using or whatever paths offering that you're using is going to be rate limited on that and so that's a way to make sure that whatever you're buying uh, is going to be um support the workload that you have i've worked on some vms where i've done um, burstable workloads that have exceeded the uh amount of IOs that I've purchased and performance literally just falls off a cliff. And then, honestly, it gets so bad sometimes we've had customer outages in cloud-based systems. So when we're looking at where that data lives outside of physically in a storage subsystem, we have database files. It's generally gonna be our read and write workloads of varying IO sizes. So when we're looking at database files, we're gonna see lots of different IO types based on what we do for our workload. We could also have multiple files spent across or split across multiple volumes, which allows us to get some parallelism out of our storage subsystems. That's starting to get a little fuzzy with NVMe drives because now we have the ability to have parallel queues to dispatch those IOs. Historically, the way that I would get parallelism out of things like SATA devices is by doing, using techniques like this, splitting across multiple uh, volumes in my storage subsystem. Transaction log files is where I want that low latency. So we talked about how important latency is a second ago. I want to make sure that I have the lowest latency for my system, support that transaction log throughput because of the synchronous flushed buffered IOs or non-buffered IOs. Has anyone ever hit the two terabyte maximum of a log file in a production system? What's up? I feel y'all, right? What happens? Things go down, right? And so we want to be careful with that one. TempDB. Um, TempDB obviously can be read write heavy. It depends a lot on uh, your IO types and your workload. The average IO size can be all over the place on that because it depends on how bad your developers are. Let's be serious. Um, but that's going to be obviously where we're reading and writing lots of data. Um, again, I work for a fancy storage company, and I even still uh, evangelize the folks that having NVMe drives backing things like that inside of a server is going to be the best that you can get because you're going to get the lowest latency, highest throughput into that type of system. Who's heard of this? And, uh, 64K NTFS allocation units, right? This is the best practice. Anyone know why this is the best practice? We just learned it was the best practice eons ago, right? I wrote a whole blog post about why. Because it, I, again, my friend Argenis taught me about this when I started working at Pure and the importance of it. But it has nothing to do with the IO size. And that's kind of the, the myth that we've had in our community for the longest time. IOs and SQL Server are variable. I have a blog post that proves it but you still want to use 64K NTFS allocation units because it's the allocation it's of how I allocate the physical blocks from the file system to consume that. And that means I can have those things still be physically adjacent when I do transact IOs for the object that I just wrote out. And that's why that's important. It has nothing to do with the size of the IO, but how the actual blocks in the storage subsystem are allocated. So let's look a little bit closer at latency. We're gonna look a little closer at latency and then jump ahead a little bit. So latency, 
we want to monitor this. It's probably the most important attribute that we have to be concerned about. Inside of SQL Server, you have this thing. It's a DMV, it's a DMIO virtual file stats. And it's going to be the average per file I.O. since the instance started up. So across all of your databases and all of your data files will be reported to you in that DMV so that you can look at that and say, I'm seeing this type of latency in that file, whether it's a user database or TempDB, and which type of file, a, a, a data file or a log file. You can write your own stuff, but from my consulting days, I would tell all of my customers to not write their own stuff and buy a monitoring tool, right? Because that's going to be, allow you to focus on the outcome, not building a tool to get, eventually get to the outcome. And so, but if you do want to roll your own, uh, I have a blog post there to tell you how to do that. So let's jump into hypervisors. Again, so about 95% of the audience here had, is running SQL Server on VMware. Probably the most important optimization that you can do is in the upper right-hand corner, you see that thing, the para-virtual SCSI adapter? If you're not running your virtual machines with a para-virtual SCSI adapter today, or you don't know what that really means, let's go have a conversation with your VMware administrator and figure out if you are running that and how fast you can change your VM to that configuration because that will double your throughput out to your storage subsystem. We can, get in, we can geek out about the details of that uh, after the session, but that's probably the most important performance optimization you can make on a VMware configuration. In addition to that, having multiple VMDKs to support your workload and multiple PV SCSI adapters to support your workload. So we'll put four of those inside of a VM. We'll attach multiple v, uh, VMDKs or uh, virtual disks to support that workload. Spread your data files across that, and you're able to get parallelism out to your storage subsystem from a VMware level. So yeah, so pretty much every vendor that has a hypervisor, VMware, Hyper-V, Red Hat, and a bunch of others have kind of this concept of a para virtual SCSI adapter that will get you good storage performance from SQL Server running inside of a VM out to your storage subsystem. There's an 87-page VMware document called Architecting SQL Server for VMware. I read that. You don't have to read that. I have a summary of that right there with a checklist of things that you should look at. So go ahead and check out that blog post there if you want to dive into all of that fun stuff. So let's get into the last slide. 20-minute sessions are tough. I should have had more coffee. Story time. So I worked as a consultant for a very long time. And there's a core application that one of my customers that was an electronic medical record in an emergency room environment. So uh, very immediate care kind of scenarios. And so that application was performing pretty poorly. Uh, let's see, if you were a doctor and you logged in and you clicked the button, it took 37 seconds to load your patient record. If you were in the emergency room, would you want to wait 37 seconds for your doctor to load your patient record so they can figure out what's going on? Some people raise their hand, but I think, uh, I think I'm getting trolled by the back left folks. That was bad. So my customer was like, you need to fix this thing. And I'm like, all right, let me fix this thing. And so what I did is this, and I walked down the entire stack and decomposed the system. I'm like, where's the slowness? Where's the latency in my application? So I looked at the web servers, I looked at the SQL servers, I looked at the hypervisors, the storage interconnects and the storage. This is pretty much how every on-prem thing looks in a modern data center. An app vendor controls, a third-party vendor controlled the web servers, the DBAs control the SQL servers, we had some VMware admins in the party, some networking folks are managing the interconnects, right, that thing that connects the servers to the storage, and we had a storage team, right? So what Anthony needed to know was where's the latency? So I started talking to folks. I was like, well, where do we see the latency in this environment for our application. And we found actually some, a lot of latency at the app tier instead of a web server config. They were running their applications in a 32-bit uh, application pool rather than 64, which caused a whole mess of issues. We fixed that up, and we got page load time down to about 17 seconds, which is still awful. DBAs were like, hey, our SQL servers are slow. The VMware admins were like, our SQL servers are slow. And our storage team had no meaningful metrics. And the storage, uh, or the networking team had no meaningful metrics, and the storage team was like, oh, everything's great, right? Where's the red flag there? Who would you call first, right? The folks with no meaningful metrics. So I went to those folks, and I'm like, hey, what's going on? And they're like, everything's great. What do you mean, there's something wrong? And I'm like, well, we're, you're the only folks that I can't figure out where the issue is. And so we dug a little deeper. The hypervisor where the servers were was connected to the storage with one eight gigabit fiber channel link. 
that was active. There were four paths. And so literally they were getting a fourth of the expected throughput out to their storage tier. We fixed that thing. We got down about seven seconds for page load time. Everybody was happy. But the moral of the story is measure, information, and understanding the path, right? All of those different things to knock that down and uh, get a kind of very under an understanding of where your data lives and how fast it's expected to get there and how much throughput is expected to get there. So that's a wrap. I'm one minute over. I apologize. Um, but please, that's the um, QR code for the session today. I appreciate y'all's time. And I'll hang out in the back for any questions if you want to dive into anything today. So appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>